Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues. This is Session 1, Part 2 of the discussion, God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance, where Jesus and Mary introduce and begin discussing the operation of God's principles and laws relating to forgiveness and repentance in response to listeners' questions. The session was recorded on 23rd of August 2017 from 11.20 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. So you spoke just now about having a knowledge of God's laws about forgiveness through personal experience. Let's talk a little bit about why God created laws in the first place. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's important that we do that because it's like, you know, we, we talk a lot about laws, but but quite often when we refer to laws, I don't think most listeners get the import of how beneficial they are mm -hmm. and how important they are for our lives and how essential they are, in fact, for our survival. In fact, when we talk about law, there's often a, a another assumption, and that is because of our, through our emotional injuries, as we've, as we've already discussed, we often presume that um, law is there to restrict us and make our lives harder. And often human law does that, but, yeah. but you know, that's not the intention of God's laws. And, and unfortunately, we, we start believing that the intention of God's laws are to make our lives more difficult and more restrictive and, and you know, to make our lives more uncertain and more unsafe and all these kind of things. And completely the opposite is true. So, mm. so I feel it's very important that we sort of talk for a little while about why God created laws in the first place. Otherwise, otherwise we have a tendency whenever we refer to law, everyone's going already with the, just the word law, go, yeah. you know, there's all these emotional injuries associated with the word. Yeah. All right. So we talk about why God bothered to create laws in the first place. And there's three main areas I'd like to focus on with you mm -hmm. in this uh, in this series. Yeah. So, firstly, that God's laws are an expression of God's principles, mm. uh, that God's laws express God's character and personality, and that God's laws create true happiness for all humans. Mm. So, so, let's start with the first one. Yep. God's laws are an expression of God's principles. Mm. Now, in the Understanding God's Loving Laws Assistance Group, which we presented in 2016, you mentioned that God's laws are an expression of God's principles. Mm. What do you actually mean by that? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's like when we talk about God's principles, it's almost like um, people sort of think of it as some kind of scientific principle thing we're talking about here. But, but really what I'm referring to is that God has personality in nature and a part of God's personality in nature is that God has principles. Mm -hmm things by which God lives, mm -hmm. if you like, things by which God exists, things that God feels are so important that nothing else is more important than these particular things. Yeah. And so if you think about it, if God feels certain things, principles are very, very important, then that, uh, if we can know what those principles are that he believes or she believes is important to, it, to, to them, then what we can do is we can start extrapolating from that mm. issues or, or understanding about God's personality in nature. Because whatever is important to a, an individual on earth, if we think about it from the point of view of a person on earth, what's important to you and the principles by which you live, mm -hmm. they do tell you a lot about your character and your nature and, and your personality. And so, so the principles that God has will tell us a lot about God's character and nature and personality. And if you use the example of the person on earth, the things that the things that are my principles, the things that I believe in strongly, that I feel are essential. And that you live by. That I well I they are those principles basically tell me about the kind of person I am, but then they generate a sort of rule set or laws that I live by, don't they? they and do. this is the relationship you're trying to draw with God, isn't it, and God's laws? Yes. Yeah. So so one reason why God created laws, because that's the real question we're asking here. Yes. One reason why God created the laws is because the laws had to be created as an expression of God's principles. Yes. 
it's the only way God could appropriately express God's principles in the universe. Mm. And so God created a whole set of laws in order for those principles Would you say it was to even be demonstrated. Uh, would you say it was even uh, an, uh, uh, almost like a something that God felt sort of impelled to do because the principles exist? It's, it's, a, it's a natural... Uh, well, I, well, no, I, the way creative. I probably liken it to is God's nature and character impelled That's... the creation of the principles uh-huh. and then God's principles impelled the creation of the laws. Yeah. And so the way I see it is the, the, the principles tell us a lot about God's character and nature and, and yeah. God's personality, the person of God. And, and this is why it's so, like, that is one primary reason why God created the laws that are based on principles, because without principles, God would be an unprincipled being. Yeah. Right. And and obviously, you know, that would cause all sorts of issues for any of God's creations, mm-hmm. because an unprincipled being means that there's no principles, there's no governing factors, there's no laws. Everything's chaos. Yeah. Then, and and if everything was chaos, how difficult would life be? You know, one moment you'd walk out and you could walk safely on the earth, and the next moment you walk out, you fly out into space because of the chaos. You know, like yeah, yeah. this is the problem with chaos as yeah. a theory is that, is that it obviously would not be very predictable and repeatable and therefore very unsafe and insecure for human life or for any kind of life actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I like about the examination of God's principles is that that we can see that actually God created laws because God has principles Mm. and and God has principles because God has personality and nature and those that personality and nature has to be expressed through principles. Yes. So it's quite quite simple for us to see it that way, but it's also quite accurate. Yeah. Mm. So if we look now at God's laws as an expression of God's character and personality, we'll look at that more specifically now. Mm -hmm. So again, in the Understanding God's Loving Laws Assistance Group, you mentioned that God's laws tell us a lot about God's character and personality. Mm -hmm. How do the laws of the universe tell us about God's nature? Well, as I said in my previous answer about God's principles, yes, um, you can see that the laws now, because the laws are the things we, we might not necessarily understand the principles in the beginning, mm-hmm. but the laws are the things that we generally can observe. So, so for example, we can observe the law of gravity. We, we can see it occurring. We can't see the principles associated with the law of gravity until we observe the effects of the law of gravity and then trace back from there to the principles, if that yeah. makes sense. So the beauty of the, the law-based examination is that, is that the law-based examination lets us see the effect of living out of harmony with the law and the effect of living in harmony with the law and then helps from that effect we can see, okay, this is something that happens that when we live out of harmony with the law. This is something that happens when we live in harmony with the law. If we add these two things together, what does that tell me about God's principles mm-hmm. and therefore God's personality and nature? And so I can trace it backwards like that by observing the effect of law and then postulating possible causes of those effects Mm -hmm. and then tracing those causes back to personality and nature. Mm -hmm. I can easily see it. And it's the same way we would do with a family who makes a specific law in their family. We can say, okay, that particular law was made. What's the effect of that law? Mm -hmm. What did that actually accomplish? And if it accomplished many good things when it was upheld, Mm -hmm. then you can say, well, doesn't that demonstrate to a degree the personality and nature of the person who created that law, that their intention was good and what what their intentions actually were. Yeah. And if it creates some outcomes in uh, that are that are that are restorative or or corrective, yep. when it's when it's not upheld, when the law is like attempted to be broken, yeah, and it creates some effects that are corrective and educational, yeah. Then we say, oh, this person really wants to educate us. And this mm-hmm. person, so in other words, not punishment, yes. but, but based on education, this person wants to educate me. But if it's punishment where they just want to give me a belting, yep. right, mm-hmm. then we go, well, maybe they're a bit resentful yeah. <laughs> when I break the law, right? Yeah, yeah. Rather than it being corrective. Yes. And so we get to see 
the personality and nature of the individuals who create the law through the laws they create. Yeah, and it's quite a stark contrast, isn't it, that you just drew when a law is corrective versus punitive. We can establish in the punitive case somebody is resentful. In the corrective case, which often feels almost very difficult when we ha- when we are in a process of correction, mm-hmm. we can sometimes call that punitive. Well, it depends on our filters yeah. as to whether we call it that or not. How we perceive that. Exactly. But if the overall outcome is that we are corrected and we do learn, <clears throat> that's then the person who created the law has quite a strong intention and desire to educate mm. and if we if we uh, contrast resentment versus a desire to educate it's it's quite difficult different isn't it yeah it's one's obviously a very different. loving intention to yeah. educate or correct and educate the other is obviously a very harmful intention to yes. to punish and be punitive and to well as the bible or, or people who say the bible what the bible says tend to indicate you know they tend to indicate that things like God created hell where you're tor- tormented eternally. Now, the intention there doesn't seem very good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So is that possibly true or not? Yeah. Obviously, you know, if, if it was true, then it would, be, it would demonstrate a, a God who's punitive and resentful and worse than the uh, than any person who's ever lived because he's going to kill obviously kill people on mass mm. uh, to to a larger extent than any person ever has so so that you know that would indicate a very punitive uh, god you know, under those circumstances mm. so so the reality is a lot of the things that are predicted by religions for example mm-hmm. uh, are never going to happen because they can only happen if god was punitive mm-hmm. and and we will see in history whether they happen or not, and, if, yeah. and, and, and oh, I can guarantee that they're not. But you know, sooner or later, over thousands or tens of thousands of years, you'll see. Oh well, they didn't happen that way. So, so God's not as punitive as what we believed. Yeah. And so this is a way of examining the personality and nature of the Creator. So you're talking about a way of examining it, but going back to our question is like, why did God even bother to make laws? Essentially, you're saying here that. God's character and personality dictated that God would make the laws. Yes. That's why God bothered, because God cared. Yes, not only because God cared, but also God takes responsibility for God's creations. Mm. See, it it would be very irresponsible for somebody to create and then not impose a law upon the creation that would govern its safe operation. Yeah. That would be a very irresponsible thing to do. Yeah. So God's not irresponsible. In fact, a definition of... You know, if we if God was truly irresponsible, He would do what many of the people on Earth believe He's done. You know, and and it's not true. It's like God is responsible being. God's created laws specifically uh, to take responsibility for God's creation. So this tells me another thing about God, as to God desires responsibility for those people who are self responsible. You know? mm. And and God does that by leading in God's example, leading that whole process. God's creations are all governed by laws. And therefore, it demonstrates that God takes direct responsibility for what God has created, mm. which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, it tells me some more things about God. So, so this is the advantage of looking at the law and also looking at principles, as we previously discussed, is that we get to understand a lot more about God's nature and personality. And in fact, what we're really saying here is two of the primary reasons before anything on the earth or in the universe existed, God created a framework of law and God did that before humans existed. Mm. So therefore, not all law was created just for humans. Mm -hmm. The law was created because God decided that it was responsible to create law Mm. and to govern God's potential creations through law. Mm. And that does make sense if you think about it. If a person is truly intelligent and truly able to take control of their creations, they would definitely have laws that govern the operation of those creations. Mm. Yeah. Okay, continuing on to in our final um, point about why God bothered to make laws at all. Mm-hmm. God's laws create happiness for all humans. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so when we look around, it seems like God has created a whole bunch of laws that are actually uh, of benefit to us. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of those benefits 
provided to us by God's laws. Yeah, so, you know, um, I suppose you could say some of the benefits, uh, the biggest benefits are not quite as obvious to humans at the moment as what they can see are some of the smaller benefits. But let's look at some of the biggest benefits. Yep. Uh, very first, largest benefit, the ability for humans to receive God's love and therefore be a transformed creature mm -hmm. comes from God creating laws. <laughs> so God didn't create laws that allow for a human soul to receive love from God's soul. There would be no way for a human creature to become divine and therefore no way for that potential to exist. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a huge benefit for, for law to exist. If law didn't exist, we would have no way of becoming a divine creature. We'd have no way of progressing beyond what was our original uh, creation, the perfect natural man, if you like. We'd have no way of progressing beyond that point. Mm. So, so that's a huge source of happiness there. Um, and in fact, for anybody who ever experiences that in the future, they'll know that that's the biggest source of happiness that they could ever experience, yeah. in fact. So without God's laws, that would not exist as a potentiality. Mm. So that's a huge thing. Yeah. Yep. Then we have uh, the love that can be experienced or exchanged between each other. Like if, if there weren't laws that governed you receiving love from me and me receiving love from you, and that I actually feel when you love me and you actually feel when I love you, not by what we do, but, but also by how we feel, if those feelings did not exist and there wasn't a mechanism via which the law would allow for the transmission and reception of those particular feelings, we would never know what it's like to be in love. Mm. We would never know what it like, it's like to love somebody else. We'd never know what it's like to feel loved by somebody else. Mm. What, what a huge problem that would be, you know, yeah. like what a huge benefit that is to our happiness. And it's terrible if we don't experience those things. It's a great creator of unhappiness on the planet when people don't understand those particular principles. So you can see that's a huge creation of happiness that is the direct result of God creating laws. Mm. So there's another big one. It's like, in fact, if you think about it, the love-based issues between us and God and the love-based issues between us and others, and particularly us and our own mate, yeah. um, the biggest sources of potential happiness to our entire life. Mm. And, and there is no other happiness is actually that even compete with that, Yeah, really. So there's two of, of the biggest causes of happiness are God creating laws for, for us to experience those things. Yeah, yeah. And some of the other things we mentioned in our summary here is the, the ability, and you've touched on these earlier in our discussion, the ability to provide security, safety and predictability in the universe. Yeah, and if we just look at that for a moment, imagine if the universe was unpredictable. Man, it'd be so confusing living, wouldn't it? It'd yeah. be like one moment you'd go and do something and it happens and the next moment you go and do the same thing and something different happens. And do you know what I mean? It, yep. it would create huge amounts of unpredictability and, and, and a feeling of fear in our lives. Like, you know, we, because of, if something's unpredictable, and this is often what's happened in a person's childhood, mum and dad's uh, reactions to childhood uh, you know desires are often unpredictable yes and so that means that one moment you're you know you think oh i'm doing the right thing and then you get hammered and the next moment you think you're doing the wrong thing but you get rewarded and and now it's all unpredictable and you don't know what right what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is bad now you have a lot of fear inside yeah. of you about taking your next step mm -hmm. you know whatever that may be mm -hmm. so you can see straight away that um, from that analysis that having predictability creates safety, security. It means that I can grow and I can, I can experience things and learn and be educated and all of these other wonderful benefits that come from law. So God have... created it for that purpose. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not continually worrying. And that's what I notice about you is because you have experienced in this life so much of God's laws again, mm -hmm. and you have faith that is knowledge in them, there's so much less worry in you than there is in me. Yeah. And, and there's even more in other people yeah. um, because there's, you understand there's, there's a predictability. If I yeah. do A, B will happen. If I don't do A, yeah. C will happen. And 
there's nothing else to worry about. I can't try and control anything else. Yeah, maybe yeah. we could look at an example there as well. Yeah. So here's an example where, again, when people get sick or have a disease of some kind, they worry immensely usually. Mm -hmm. There's a huge amount of fear that gets generated by that. If I get sick, um, I say, well, okay, something inside of me is in uh, and disharmony with love. All I've got to do now is find it. Yeah. <laughs> and the laws, it's other laws, law of attraction and law of cause and effect and other laws are all telling me what it is and I'm just not observing enough. So as long as I observe more and pray more about that and I'll, I'll find out what it is and then once I, that happens, I'll cure this problem, whatever this problem yeah. is. Yeah. So, you know, uh, like if I got cancer or uh, some other illness uh, that's, that's generally life thought to be life-threatening, the way I look at it is exactly the same way. I just need to find the yeah. underlying reason why I've got this particular problem, what's caused inside of me, and, and it doesn't, and it gives me this feeling of uh, that I don't have to worry so much about things that happen to me or my body or anything else. They've all got causes, and mm -hmm. as long as I can trace down the causes, I'll be right in the long run. Yes. Mm. And also in your decision making, you, you, you have established enough to know that. If I don't tell the truth, pain results, for, not just for me, but for others. Yeah. So there's no decision, will I tell the whole truth here or won't I? No. You just tell the whole truth. And for most people, that's a big weighing up. What should I say? Should I say this? What? Oh, yeah, I don't even think you know. about what I have to say. <laughs> no, and yes, it makes your life far less stressful. And complicated. And yeah. complicated. I don't have to worry about what the effects are going to be because I trust it. Yeah. If I say the truth, then it's all going to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So another way that God's laws create happiness um, is that when we follow God's laws or live in harmony with God's laws, we're automatically happy. Yes, and this is what, what, I'm, what we meant by that really is that is that when you follow God's laws, everything's in harmony. It feels like everything's in harmony too. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel like everything's smooth. Yeah. Like there's no trauma or difficulties. Um, everything that you desire happens mm. because your desires are harmonious with love too. Mm -hmm. So so everything you desire phys finishes up happening. If your desires are out of harmony with love, then they don't happen, you know, and so it goes. And so, you know, you know that, oh, if something's not happening very smoothly, then something it must be out of harmony with love here. You know, I can determine that. I can work through that. And And this is the beauty of it is you can you can work through issues this way, knowing with predictability if something causes your unhappiness, then um, there's a high likelihood there's some laws being broken here that you're breaking them, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that you need to repair that. And uh, that's probably the final thing is that God's laws actually act to correct an unhappy person to yes. bring them into a state of happiness, don't they? Yeah, and that's a beautiful thing when you yes. think about it. Like, most laws of humans are not made to make somebody happy or to help a person become self-realizing and happy mm -hmm. through a process you know that created if, if if you break the law generally on earth uh, or you attempt to you break the law on earth you're generally punished and 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 the purpose of it is to make you unhappy yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that you don't do it again that's yes, yeah. uh, that's their idea right but, but god's laws are not trying to make you unhappy. Mm -hmm. They're just correcting you to bring you back to happiness is, is their underlying reason for them. And this is the beauty, beautiful thing about God too. The intention is that you become happy again, that, that if you're really unhappy now, you can become happy again. Mm. Isn't that wonderful? Mm. Like, so you can see, and, and these are only some, obviously, of yeah. the benefits of to humans of having God's laws created for them. But isn't it wonderful God did it? Because without it, you know, there's so many things we'd miss out on. Yeah. Um, so the way I see law, and particularly God's laws, is very, very different to what I notice people at our group see God's laws. Mm. Most people at our group see God's laws as very, you know, that every time we mention them, there's a usually an adverse reaction yeah. emotionally. Uh, there's a great fear associated with God's laws that mm -hmm. doesn't need to exist, but you can see why it does, because often there's a fear related to human law and particularly parental law. Yeah. Um, you can see why it exists, but but it doesn't need to exist when it comes to God. And and often anger, isn't there, about the idea of restriction and yeah. limitation and Yeah, manipulation, control and all these other concepts 
uh, all come up for most people when they start when we start talking about law. And you can see under those circumstances that people are not understanding why God made laws for them, it's mm. only for their benefit. Mm. No, there's no drawbacks of having God's laws. There might be drawbacks with human law, and as we discussed in the Understanding God's Loving Laws Assistance Group, there are definitely, you know, many of those come from drawbacks in parental law, because yeah. parental law often was very changeable and unpredictable. Mm. But when it comes to God's laws, God's laws are not that like that at all. Mm. Mm. And so to summarise our segment here, we're talking about why God created laws. Mm -hmm. And basically you've taken us through the fact that God's laws are a reflection of God's principles mm. and a reflection of God's personality and nature mm -hmm. and that the laws were created to bring about humans' happiness. So that's why God did it, because God has is a certain nature and personality that God's her yeah. principles, which guides her creation of law. But obviously that nature and personality is very interested in making humans happy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That tells us a lot about God's nature too, right? Yeah. So it's not going to come along and destroy the wicked. God wants the wicked redeemed. Yes. You know, that's quite yes. clear. If you examine law, all law is about redemption of some kind. And even the physical laws are about redeeming us from making mistakes that cause our own damage. So, you know, they're all about redemption of some kind. And and this is it. like, instead of looking at law all down in the mouth and going, oh, we're not going to talk about law again, are we? Oh, goodness me, oh, I'm sick of this. Oh, oh, I just want to, the more I hear about law, the worse it gets. Oh, it's terrible. And the big reactions that people seem to have. We should be having party every time we, <laughs> every time we hear about a law, you know. It's fantastic. This, this, we should be partying every time we find out a new law. Bam, there's another party there, you know. There's a whole heap of things that creates for our unhappiness. You know? It does. And I think when you start to emotionally open up to the idea that God's law is different from the law that we've experienced customarily on earth mm. in our upbringing or in society, it does seem like good news every time we talk about it to mm. me because mm. I think, oh, phew, it's not, it's not what I've experienced. It's no. something way better. Yeah. And let's talk more, you know. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, I, I feel that if we have the right attitude to law mm -hmm. and we see the reason you know all the good reasons why god mm -hmm. created laws then we when we discuss individual laws like the law of forgiveness or the law of repentance or other laws we will have a fascination in the subject at hand and we will want to understand it so that we can apply it emotionally in our lives rather than feeling uh, the opposite of that, which is often this feeling of, don't tell me more, I don't want to hear more, I'd rather be ignorant. And, and we're not understanding in that place that the ignorance that we'd rather be in is what is causing more of our pain. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's far better to be informed rather than ignorant because our own happiness depends on being informed. So, like I said, we would have parties Mm. You know, every law that we come to understand in our heart, we would, you know, you'd forget birthday parties and you'd forget Mother's Day and you'd forget Father's Day and you'd forget Christmas and whatever, and you'd be focused on having a party every time you understood a new law. You know what I mean? And if the whole world discovered a new law for the first time, let's have a world party about that because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's going to benefit everybody in the world, right? And I, yeah, I just sort of feel like if we have the right attitude to law, we, we would have a very, very different response to discussions about yeah. law and discussions about specific aspects of individual law. Yeah. Instead of being dismissive, we would be very inquisitive. Mm. Mm. So far in our discussion of God's truth about forgiveness, we've talked firstly about, well, how do we know God's truth about anything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the relevance um, or the relevance of law to understanding God's truth. Mm. And now I'd like to move on more directly to how God's laws are relevant to the subject of forgiveness, because yeah. that's, that's the overall theme of our series, isn't it? Of, God's laws and principles, how we can personally engage them in the process of forgiveness. Yes, so. and I suppose in some future discussion we need to focus the attention on repentance rather than just forgiveness. But 
in this conversation, we're going to discuss some things regarding repentance because yeah. there are similar principles involved yes. with repentance to forgiveness. But obviously, when it comes to repentance, we're not discussing everything about repentance. So I just need to probably mention that at this stage, that we're discussing primarily the aspects of forgiveness now, mm -hmm. but there will be things we have to involve repentance in, in that discussion, which we will do. But, uh, but the discussion won't be a complete discussion about repentance, but we'd like it to be a fairly complete discussion <laughs> or, 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 or a relatively informed discussion about forgiveness. About forgiveness, mm. yeah, that's right. We will, we do have a section on repentance specifically coming up, mm. uh, but as you said, it's not exhaustive and we are trying to be reasonably exhaustive <laughs> on the subject of forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so mm. as we've just been discussing God's laws, God's laws actually control the operation of forgiveness, don't they? Mm. So how do they control the operation of forgiveness? <clears throat> well, forgiveness is an emotional aspect of the human soul. And we know that God's laws govern the human soul. So therefore, God's laws govern the operation of forgiveness as well, mm -hmm. because the forgiveness is an operation or an action taken by the human soul. So that's... I feel the first thing we need to realise. And if we understand that, then we'll start to see, oh, it's not just a some figment of some guy's imagination that forgiveness exists. Mm -hmm. And it's not some figment of some religious person's creation that forgiveness exists. But rather, it is an actual operation that acts upon the soul that determines whether forgiveness has occurred or not. And, mm. and it's the operation upon the soul is the thing we need to focus our attention on. Mm. Mm. And we'll talk specifically about how the soul-based operations occur in our next ses section. But mm -hmm. really here, we just really wanted to say that it's a law-based process, this forgiveness thing. <laughs> Is a, is a law-based process, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it's, it, if you could think about the internal workings of the human soul mm -hmm. as, a, as a scientific fact, then you would understand that forgiveness is one of the internal workings of the human soul, mm -hmm. that it, it can be mathematically defined, and it is actually mathematically defined, and there are processes involved, which we'll talk about later, yeah. but everything, everything is based upon the fact that the human soul has principles or laws that govern its operation. Yeah. And forgiveness and repentance, of course, are operations or actions that can be taken by the human soul under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so therefore are governed by the laws that control the human soul. Yeah. Yes, and it's quite uh, um, scientific, isn't it? There are specific laws involved mm -hmm. and there's specific scientific uh, conditions yes. under which forgiveness can be engaged. And they, can, they occur with mathematical certainty. The If a, if a soul makes that desire-based choice to forgive, yes. then there's a mathematical process that occurs through the uh, interaction or through the operation mm -hmm. of the always operating God's laws that the soul now comes into harmony with the operation of those laws and dismisses other certain laws that were acting upon it previously. Mm -hmm. And all of that is scientific. It's not, as you said, just something that you talk about or you go, oh, I've forgiven. And, and, or it's not an airy fairy concept. It's quite literal, isn't it? Yes. It's almost like um, we've talked about many other aspects of the human soul. For example, when the human soul has faith and when the human soul has courage or when the human soul has an emotion of love or kindness or compassion or any of these kind of emotions, they all are mathematical principles that exist within the human soul and govern, you know, the, and the interactions are governed by mathematical laws. And so, so the same processes govern forgiveness. Mm. And if we can understand the mathematical laws involved, then we will understand completely how forgiveness actually works. Mm -hmm. Then we have an opportunity to engage it mm -hmm. properly, mm -hmm. rather than just it being some kind of 
you know what I noticed with forgiveness? It's like one of the, it's, it's a very religious concept that's turned into a very religious concept today. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be. It's a scientific principle of truth regarding the human soul. It's not a religious concept. Mm. Forgiveness is not a religious concept. Mm -hmm. It is a scientific principle of truth about the soul and how it operates. And we need to get that if we're truly going to engage forgiveness in our day-to-day -day life. We need to get that it is a scientific, mathematically certain principle that is engaged by the human soul. It's predictable, its outcomes are certain, mm -hmm. but only when it's engaged in harmony with the law. Yes, awesome. And that's it. That's it, <laughs> full stop. <Yeah. laughs> okay, let's now speak more specifically about how God's laws actually, how God's laws control the operation of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So firstly, you've said that law controls the operation of all soul-based processes. Mm -hmm. So we've said that forgiveness is a soul-based process in an operation of the soul. Mm -hmm. How do laws actually act upon the soul's operations? Well, every, uh, this, every energy that passes through the soul is mathematically measurable. Mm -hmm. Every emotion is energy. So every emotion that passes through the soul is mathematically measurable. So the law, God's laws, mathematically measure and act upon what's going on inside of the human soul at any one single point in time. So anything that goes on in the soul, anything you think, anything you feel, anything, any thought you have, any feeling you have, any action you take, yep. are all energies in motion and therefore are all mathematically able to be defined and therefore are all mathematically able to be measured. Mm -hmm. And God's laws are the measuring instrument of these energies. The laws have been created in such a way to measure what's going on inside of the soul and to interact with it in such a way to either reward it or correct it. So that's how the laws generally work mm -hmm. in terms of how the human soul functions. So that's good news because you've mentioned mathematics a lot. Mm -hmm. but that's basically saying I don't have to know the maths of how my soul operates. I don't have to know algebra and all the equations. Yeah, highly complex equations <laughs> yeah. and it won't be for many thousands of years that you will understand them. So I don't have to know it. Mm -hmm. It is true. It is mathematically occurring. I don't have to know the maths because the laws measure the maths. Excellent. All I've got to do is understand the principle of the law and now I can engage the law without having to understand the mass. Beautiful. Yeah, isn't that kind of God? <laughs> Very kind. Because <laughs> otherwise a child would not be able to engage the law. Yeah. So God created it so that a child can engage the law, which then allows for the child, even though it does not know the mathematics that define the law, it can understand the law's concepts. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Very clever system. It is. Mm. So then how do God's laws specifically affect the soul operation when it comes to forgiveness? All right. So now we're referring to forgiveness specifically. Yeah. What, what's going on with forgiveness? You know, so the, the real question is how God's laws control the operation of forgiveness. Well, 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 it's the same way that God's laws control the operation of any emotional energy flow within the soul. It measures it, mm -hmm. quantifies it, mm -hmm. and acts upon it either to reward it or correct it. Yeah. It's exactly the same way as God's laws operate on any emotional experience, any energy flow within the soul. And remember, this not only includes emotions, but it also includes thoughts and actions. Mm -hmm. It includes everything you can do is able to be measured because it is mathematically quantifiable. Mm. And, and what that means now is that we have a mathematically quantifiable definition that we can summarise without using mathematics yeah. and put into such simple language that even a child could understand mm -hmm. to help us understand what forgiveness actually is. And how we'll know if we're engaging it, if we are... Uh are choosing not to engage it, if we have completed it, or the if we're in the process of, of it. it. The effects of not yep. engaging it, the, 
the effects on internally, the effects externally, all are quantifiable. Yeah. And therefore measurable and therefore able to be acted upon and make decisions about. And explainable as we plan to do in the rest of this discussion. Correct, yeah. correct. And, yeah. and it's such a wonderful thing if you yeah. think about it that God has done. If you think about the true significance of those things that we've just mentioned, you will see that, wow, you know, this gives me the ability without needing to understand the mathematical complexity, the ability to understand the law mm -hmm. and engage it. So if I can give an example, yeah. it's a bit like if we refer to the law of gravity, most people now, or a lot of people would have been taught in their childhood or in their educational life, the, the quantity of gravity on the earth, how to measure it based on the mass of the earth and, and so forth and their own mass and how the two attract each other and so forth. So we know that it's a mathematical equation that can be defined based on mass that creates gravity and then the force of gravity that has and what force it has on the human body and why, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we can quantify all of those specific things. Yep. But you don't need to know all that in order to live in harmony with the law. Yeah. Because all, all you need to do is jump off a building that's too high <laughs> and you know its effect. Yeah. Or you just jump off the ground, uh, just normally jumping along, you know, and you know that that's safe, right? No bad effect, right? You also know that if there's a cushioning effect of air or other substances that can slow down your rate of gravitational pull there through, through compression or other or other techniques, aerodynamics and so forth, then that's also safe. But you don't need to know all the laws involved unless you're designing vehicles that take into account all of those things. Yeah. You can actually embrace the law without having to know all of the mathematics. Yeah. But to truly grasp the entirety of the law, embracing the mathematics is the fascinating part because now you can create devices mm. that embrace the law. You can create things that enjoy the process of acting in harmony with the law and therefore enhance your life. So, so I'm not saying understanding the mathematics isn't a good thing, yeah. it is, but you don't need to. Yeah. Right? And the same is applied here with the aspect of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You don't need to understand the mathematics involved. You just need to understand the underlying principles just like with gravity, you just need to understand the underlying principle. And that is you go too high, you'll get hurt mm -hmm. if you jump off. But if you're just of a certain amount of distance, it's, everything's pretty safe. Isn't yeah. that wonderful? Yeah. And you can act in harmony with the law and enjoy life in harmony with the law without having to go into the mathematical complexity of the law. Unless, of course, you want to become an engineer, then you want to mm -hmm. understand the yes. mathematical complexity. Of the but law. as you've said, with forgiveness, it's... It, the maths is way beyond uh, where we Current are. Current human uh, capacity to, mm -hmm. to, to, fun to function mathematically on Earth because, because it involves dimensional existences and other, other types of mathematics which are far more complex than the average supercomputer on the planet can even contemplate or, or calculate. So, so the reality is the mathematics involved are quite complicated. Um, later on in your existence, you will understand them. Mm -hmm. Yep, but 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 initially you can engage the law without understanding them, mm. 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 which is fantastic. You can reap the benefits of engaging the law without having to understand the law's complete operation mathematically. Mm. 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 But that's how it works. That's how God's laws control the operation of forgiveness. <laughs> mm. Yes, and that's why it's relevant to discuss God's laws when it comes to the subject of forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. So we're still working through our preliminary information <laughs> on God's truth about forgiveness. We're yeah. having to establish a lot of core uh, principles, truths, basic facts. basic facts, which we're going to build on later in our discussion. Yeah, and, you know, it's going to make it much easier, I feel, to answer the questions later in our discussion to go through these facts for this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So now I'd like to move on to who and what is harmed by disobeying God's laws. Mm -hmm. 
And there's about four areas I'd like to focus on mm -hmm. uh, with regards to disobedience to God's laws. But first, let's talk about a, a common way we talk about law, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is to break law. Yeah. So we can't actually break God's laws, can we? Or perhaps I should say, is there a problem <laughs> with using the terminology breaking God's laws? Yes, there is, obviously. The, the reality is God's laws are so well made that any attempt to break them still is going to operate in harmony with law. <laughs> so so yeah, there's just going to be a penalty or consequence for that attempt, but the law is still operational. You can't actually act, you can't actually act in such a way that law is no longer operational. Mm -hmm. so, so this whole concept of breaking the law probably isn't a good concept to, to, you know, to, to sort of base our discussions on. We need to probably instead use the term obedience to God's law, what happens, and disobedience to God's law, what happens. Mm -hmm. Because um, when we analyse all of God's laws, they all have actions that are operational if we obey mm -hmm. and actions that are operational if we disobey. So the law is still operational. <laughs> We're just it's... attempting to disobey, and that causes certain reactions of the law. And there are attempts to obey, and that causes other actions of the law, mm -hmm. and so forth. So if, if we can um, draw a comparison, say, between earthly law mm -hmm. and God's laws mm -hmm. on this point. So if I um, decide to break into someone's home and steal their stuff. Yep. Now, the law says I'm not allowed to do that. Yes. In Australia, it says that's illegal. Yes. It's against, it's, the law is saying you do not enter somebody's home if it's not, if, unless you're invited kind yes. of thing. You yes. Know? Um, and you certainly don't take their property. And you don't take their property unless, unless it's, it's given. given. Yeah. That's what the law says. So when I break into someone's house and I take their stuff, I haven't got permission, they haven't given it to me, and I'm doing it without their knowledge, I've broken human law. You've disobeyed the human law. I've disobeyed the human law. Yeah. Can I say that I've, if nobody catches me, if nobody does anything, can you say like I've broken that law? Well, no, the law is broken itself. <laughs> the law is broken. Like you haven't broken it. The law is broken. Okay. So the and law what, itself is broken because it doesn't. Why it's broken. It's broken because it doesn't correct it. It doesn't correct you when you've actually disobeyed yes it's broken so it doesn't work <laughs> but if if i go to the end of the street and there's a police officer there and he arrests me and i go to court and yep. they say this is wrong what you've done you're going to have to have a consequence yes then the law is upheld it's not broke it, it hasn't the law itself hasn't been broken uh-huh right but see with god's laws it's impossible to break them so, so let's... with human laws you can they are broken in their in in the way they work because it's impossible for humans Mm -hmm. to fully up uphold the law under every circumstance. Yes. So human law by nature is broken. It's broken. It's all broken. <laughs> it, it, it's a broken concept mm -hmm. even. It, 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 it help, is it helpful for society, mm -hmm. but unfortunately the way it's currently upheld, it's not enforceable fully. So, so your definition of a law that is not broken is is uh, legitimate or is it operational law? That it's is operational, that no matter whether we think we've broken it, whether we've broken it, whether we're caught by humans, not caught by humans, you're always caught by God. Okay. You're always caught by the law. The law itself is never broken. The law itself always works. It always <laughs> operates. It always works. So, yes. Yeah, so if I can get to the heart of what I think you're trying to say, you're trying to say that the law, the, the unbroken law, always and immediately imposes a consequence for either being for in disharmony action. or in harmony. For every action, it. harmonious or disharmonious, yeah. every action. So then the per if I go and steal my neighbour's stuff, yes. how does God's law operate? Automatically, you have there's a penalty on the soul. Yeah. Automatically. Yeah. You, you've automatically broken not just one, but a large number, yeah. in fact, of God's laws just by taking that one action. Mm -hmm. And... So what that means is 
that God's law is upholding itself yes. all the time. Yes. It, there's an immediate penalty on your soul. There's an immediate consequence. You might not feel it immediately because of your detunement mm -hmm. from your own sensitivity, from your conscience and from other aspects of your soul. But you will in the future be certain that you broke the law in that moment because and of that, how the law operates. And that that consequence has been within you since that moment. And has been enforced. Yes. And has had its consequences by living within you without you removing it mm. for that period of time. Mm. Every single aspect of the law cannot. The law itself is never broken because the law itself remains intact. It remains operational. It works every time. It operates the same way every time. You can't break it like you can a human law. The human law by nature is broken because it's not upheld in every circumstance, in every situation. It, it's therefore broken. Mm -hmm. it, it, the law itself is broken. You disobey. If you're caught, it's upheld. But if you're not caught, the law has been broken and no, it hasn't been upheld. Yeah. So the law itself is broken. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, doesn't do what it was designed to do. Yeah. God's laws always do mm -hmm. what they're designed to do. No exceptions, no mistakes. Mm -hmm. So we can, though, willfully and purposefully act in disharmony with, with what? God's law? No, or? we can purposefully attempt to disobey. Yes. But the, the disobedience, the law itself operates immediately upon the disobedience. Well, aren't you saying that there's no way you can actually disobey the law because the law... Well, you can attempt to disobey its proper... Uh, its your, operation for your happiness. Yes. Yeah. And the only result is going to be unhappiness. Yeah. But there is, it is always going to be upheld. Mm -hmm. the, the law will upheld your own unhappiness yeah. because of what you chose to do. Yes. Right? It will enforce your own unhappiness, in fact. Mm-hmm. Right, because every law of God has an option, has an action. It works every time, without fail, without mistakes, and without exception. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so the whole concept of breaking law, we're probably better off calling it disobeying mm -hmm. law, and because the law itself cannot, God's law itself cannot is not broken ever. They can't be broken, and they can only be obeyed. Or disobeyed and the law itself will uphold consequences in each case yes and i had to also here to ask you what does it mean to work in disharmony with god's laws i think you've sort of answered that but is there anything yeah so we're like talking that? here about tr uh, the attempt of disobedience mm -hmm. and i say the word attempt because it's a short-lived when i say short-lived it may be hundreds or even thousands of years but in the end it's going to be corrected God's laws are all about correction and education. So it's an attempt. So when you're acting in disharmony with the law, you're making a rebellious attempt <laughs> to be disobedient. Yeah. But it, it's only it's it's its purpose is only going to create your unhappiness. You, you're, you're like the law itself has been established to create your unhappiness if you attempt to disobey it. Mm. And it's, and it's there to create your happiness if you attempt to obey it. Mm. Right? So th that's the beauty of God's laws. They're very predictable in that way. That every time you feel unhappy, it's because you've attempted to disobey mm. one of the laws. And given, more, more, <laughs> well, the laws. <laughs> and given that the, the overarching theme of our whole series of discussions is about God's laws about forgiveness mm -hmm. that indicates that when we attempt to bring ourselves in harmony with the law of forgiveness, it's going to bring about our happiness. Yes, and also the converse. Mm. If we attempt to disobey the laws of forgiveness by not engaging forgiveness, mm. it's going to bring us unhappiness. Mm. See, there's, a lot of people sort of think that forgiveness is optional. <laughs> they believe because we have free will that forgiveness is optional. Yeah. But the reality is... It's not that optional. <laughs> well, None of God's laws are really optional. We have free will, sure, but at the end of the day, the law will be upheld, yeah. and and we will feel the penalty of breaking it if we and disobeying it mm. if we decide to disobey it. Mm. We will. Yes, and and perhaps in summary from our notes, I can mention that we can purposefully attempt to 
or unknowingly work in disharmony with the law. Mm -hmm. But when we do this, there are penalties. Yes. Now, obviously, we'll talk more about the penalties later about being different, depending on a purposeful attempt and, a, and an accidental mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. But obviously, um, the law itself operates. <laughs> the laws are going to correct any behaviour that's out of harmony with the law, including behaviour that is accidental. Yeah. <laughs> that will also be corrected. Yeah. It, it would be corrected a little differently yeah. than law that you, 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 the attempt to disobey purposefully. Mm. Yeah, we'll talk about that in the next section. Yeah, it's also interesting too. Humans often believe they're doing something accidentally when they're doing something purposefully. Mm. So <laughs> God's definition of purposeful is a lot more refined yes. than human definition of purposeful as well. Mm. 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 So now let's look at God's laws specifically in relation to how they measure intention. Yeah. So we've just said that we can purposefully attempt or unknowingly work in disharmony with the law. Mm -hmm. But when we do, there's penalties. I suppose my question is, how does this relate to an intention and what do the penalties for disobedience depend upon? Yes, well, the beauty of God's laws is remember that every, we remember we said in a previous question, mm -hmm. a previous area of discussion, that um, our, every single emotion that passes through the soul is measurable and quantifiable mathematically. Intention or desire is an emotion that passes through the soul. And an intention or emotion, a desire in a specific direction, has a different flavour, mathematical flavour, mm -hmm. to an intention and desire in another direction. Mm. So for, to give an example of that, a sexual intention and desire has a different measure, mm -hmm. has a different quantifiable measure, than a lie-based or truth-based potential or desire, mm -hmm. intention or desire. And that's got a different measure. Right? than a fear-based intentional desire. And that's got a different measure than a shame-based intentional desire and so forth. Yep. So now we've got the law being able to measure quantifiably through mathematical formulas the flow of energy that passes through the soul related to intention and where that intention is directed. Mm -hmm. So now God has a mechanism to measure intention. Mm. as well as outcome. And this is a beautiful thing that God has done because God measures intention almost as much as God measures the outcome of your intention. So in other words, you can intend to do something good, but you fail, mm -hmm. but God measures it as if you succeeded. Mm. Quite scary in the converse, though, isn't it? <laughs> of course, you can intend to do something bad and yes. fail. Yeah. So you can intend to murder someone or something like that and fail, but God measures it as if you succeeded. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and so it's very important for us to understand that the law operates upon this intention, the desire that drives us. It's very just, isn't it? Because say, for example, I intend to really destroy you as a person. Mm -hmm. That's my intention. And, and I that intention obviously leads me to action. But that's my heartfelt intention. Mm -hmm. But then you, through personal qualities you've developed of your own, somehow come through that you're not destroyed as a person. Um, or let's say you fail for some other reason. Like you've been precluded by destroying me through some uncontrollable, unforeseen event that you couldn't control. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I suppose that I was saying is if the variable was based, if it was based on my... Actual action. No, if mm -hmm. it was based on my success. Yes, so that's what I'm saying, your actual action being successful. Successful, yep. Um, so then it would be dependent not just on my intention, but on the qualities and characteristics of the person I intend the action towards. Yeah, it would almost make it okay to hurt people who get through it, <laughs> wouldn't it? Well, yes, and also it would mean that um, 
if I had the intention to destroy two people and I succeeded in one case because of, you know, there was something in them that meant it was successful and I didn't succeed with you, uh, I, the penalty would be less with you. And, and that's, that's not the case. No, because it's that's anyway, you get my point. It's based on your. Yeah, um, do our listeners. <laughs> well, no, no, because you keep going. Yeah, yeah. No, and I'm no, like, but oh, see, so I, what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is whether your intention turned out to be successful or not, whether the success was through your own means or through external events that caused you to not be successful, it'll still be measured as if you were successful. Yes. And my point is that it's attributable, it's very just, that it's attributable to the individual and their intention because the other variables are dependent on that individual and their intention. Or external help. Or, or external other people, factors. Other external factors. Yes. Uh, which, which, uh, which God also measures and helps those people re and respond, the laws also respond yes. to those people's in good intentions. intentions. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, yes, your bad intentions will be completely and quantifiable <laughs> down to the finest grain yeah. of what you were deciding you wanted to do, whether you were successful, successful doing it or not. Because it's a very, it's a very uh, significant point you make that uh, they could hack it. So it was okay that I did it, yeah. which is very common kind of an attitude on earth. Very common. You see yeah. this very much in uh, relationships between husbands and wives. Yeah. There is this common viewpoint, oh, they can hack my anger outbursts all the time. So, you know, it's no, there's no problem there, you know. Yeah. And quite frequently we, uh, as a result, treat people we so-called love worse than we treat other people because yeah. they can't hack it you know? yeah. they, they get back at us you know <laughs> and and god measures it all the same like yeah. whether the person hacked it or you know came through it or yeah. not it was our intention that god measured yes and this is why most people pass into the spirit world with a lot of confusion because they don't understand that they're in such poor condition because God's measured their intentions, mm. not just just the outcomes of their actions. Yeah. Many actions on earth are unsuccessful, mm. even though their intention has, has been strong. Has been strong. Yeah. Because of a lot of mitigating and external factors. Mm. But God still God's laws still measure them as if they were successful. Mm. So if you intended to abort your child but didn't, or you intended to murder somebody but you didn't, you intended to rape someone but you couldn't. It still, God still acts as if you did it, mm. and God's laws act as if you did it, mm. and God's laws correct your actions based on the fact that you did it, even yeah. though you believe you're only intended to do it. Yeah, yeah, and that's the point here, isn't it? That God's laws are measuring our intention, and that the penalties for disobedience to law are based strictly on intention. Yes, Although, so, so if our intention was to disobey the law, mm -hmm. but we went ahead and obeyed it mm. physically, God measures our intention to disobey it. So this is a question I have for you about intention, because it feels to me when there is a fully fledged or fully developed intention, it's very difficult to act in opposition to that intention. So um, it, can you have like a fledgling intention that's not fully formed and it, how does that work? Yeah, I don't know if I'd agree that a fully formed intention always results in action because there are many mitigating circumstances on the planet, including the fear of individuals internally that cause them to not act in ways they intend. So to give an example of that, many men on the planet do have emotions where they'd be prepared to rape under certain circumstances, mm. right? If there was no law governing rape, there would be many more rapes, mm. unfortunately, because of the intentions mm -hmm. of many men that exist within them. And the only reason why they don't rape is because there's a law that might put them in jail for 10 years that actually keeps them out. You know, that, that is the mitigating circumstance mm. that causes them to not go ahead and actually take the action. Now, under those circumstances, the fact that the desire to rape exists within them mm -hmm. is going to be measured by God's laws. Mm. So here, can we use desire and intention synonymously? Yes. Mm -hmm. And 
So it's possible to have, from what you're saying, desires in multiple directions. So I want to rape a woman, but I don't want to be uh, penalised. So, so I've got a desire to not be put in jail and a desire to rape a woman occurring at the same time. Yeah. That might mitigate my desire to rape a woman so that I don't actually rape a woman. Yeah. But at the end of the day, God's laws are measuring both desires. Mm. They even measure why we decided not to rape a woman because mm. it wasn't based on anything good. It was only based on the threat of punishment. Yes. So it even measures that. Right? God's laws measure everything yeah. down to that fine, <laughs> fine detail. Mm. But their intentions are based on different topics, aren't they? Like I can't have a simultaneously desi simultaneous desire to rape a person and to do a right by them or something. Or, uh, no, you, if you have a sexualized or power-based desire to rape a woman, which mm -hmm. is usually a sexual power that you want over the woman, yep. um, that obviously is still present within the person yes. as an intention. Yes. And under certain circumstances, that person will do it. Yeah. Obviously, mm. depending on the amount of external circumstances and, the, you know, what actually happens. So, for example, if they weren't married a anymore mm -hmm. or, or they weren't obeyed against the law anymore or they weren't regularly getting sex from somebody else mm -hmm. or they, you know, uh, there might be other factors involved, they might engage that particular behaviour. Mm. You follow me? If they didn't have power over another woman somewhere else in their life and so forth, that yeah. might they might engage that particular behaviour. God's laws measure every single mm. reason why you didn't do something as well as every single reason why you did. Mm. And if your reasons for not doing something are just as bad as your reasons for doing something, God measures that too. Yeah. Right. It's, quite, it's quite sobering, isn't it, when you think about... Uh, what are my true intentions and what are my true reasons for not acting on certain intentions? Yeah. And often we're telling ourselves that one, a, a negative or an unloving intention doesn't even exist. And two, sometimes if we establish that it does, we say, oh, but I don't want to engage it for a loving reason. But that's not, that can't be correct because otherwise the desire wouldn't be there in the first place. Yeah, although I feel still on earth a lot of people don't understand that you can remove desires yes. that are unloving. Yes. You see, there is this underlying uh, belief about emotions on the planet, isn't there, that once you have an emotion in you, you can't really get rid of it. You know, mm. once a pedophile, always a pedophile type of thinking. Mm. And, and these kind of things are not true. They're not true, but they do require sincere addressing of spe specific emotions through the process of repentance. But but for most people, they don't engage those processes emotionally. Mm. And so they finish up having these desires that they don't understand and therefore beginning to act upon them. Mm. Right? So there's a lot of reasons why a person may not release the desire that's intentionally bad. Yeah. And, and some of those reasons have nothing to do with the actual desire itself. You know, they have, mm -hmm. uh, there are other belief systems that exist within the individual. Mm -hmm. But what we're saying here is that every emotion that exists within the individual, even the reason why they have the desire in the first place, is yeah. measurable by God in the individual. So everything is quantified and everything is measured and everything is actually acted upon. By God's laws. Yes. So the penalties, the, the penalties for disobedience to God's laws are based purely on the intention to disobey. Yes. Yeah. And and the and the reasons why a person obeys are also measured mm -hmm. as intentions. <laughs> yeah. So if the only reason why you're obeying is because of some kind of selfish reason. Yeah like the prevention of your own pain or the prevention of your own fear or something like that, mm. then that's not considered to be a rewarding experience under God's laws. Mm. God's laws reward actual loving intention, mm -hmm. not intentions to obey that are unloving. Mm. Yeah, so we need to understand that as well. Mm. Mm. Yes, and uh, all of this has relevance to our further discussion. Of course it does. Yeah. Oh, forgive me. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on. Some penalties for disobedience mm -hmm. to God's laws. Mm -hmm. What are some of the penalties for disobedience to God's laws? 
Well, obviously, every single law has multitudes and multitudes of different penalties associated with disobedience. You say obviously, but it's probably not obvious to most people. But Well, I don't know. Um, just let me have a go. Well, I, I say multitudes, but um, I think it's fairly obvious if you look at physical laws. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we look at a, just a simple physical law where we go up on top of a 10 foot high building and we jump off. A, a 10 story high building, not a 10 foot high one. You probably survived that. <laughs> yeah. I'm story, mismetric nodding. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 10 foot, yeah. A 10 story high building, jump off. Probably, you know, particularly if the ground is very firm or is concrete or something like that, we're going to die, right? God's laws, uh, obviously, there's the initial thing that we die. Yep. Right. So that's obviously a penalty associated yes. with breaking the law. But there's other subsequent, uh, what we could classify as flow on effects of our death. Our, we are no longer on the earth. We can no longer benefit human society. We no longer benefit our family. We no longer benefit our friends. We no longer experience love from our family that they can actually feel or we can feel from them unless they've, you know, because most people don't feel anything they can't see. And then, and so you could say that there's a one penalty we died. Mm -hmm. But, but actually, there's many, many, many other penalties mm. that have followed on mm. from breaking that one law. Yep. Right. Now, if we're pushed off, there's a whole set of other potential penalties too. You know, like the, the family members get resentful and feel angry with the person who pushed them and, and so forth and so forth. So there's a lot of flow and effects of every single action or every single event mm -hmm. and every single intention. Mm -hmm. You can even have an intention, so, so give an example of this. Most religious leaders on this planet do this, and it's very, very damaging. The religious leaders state an intention of the religion to damage some other religion. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a Muslim leader decides he wants to go on a jihad, jihad against the Christian faith or something like that. Yeah. Or the Christian faith decides he's going to protect the Christian faith by fighting the Muslim faith and he's going to defend the faith you know, mm -hmm. with arms if necessary. Mm -hmm. That person just stating that creates intentions in other people who are following that teaching. So it's like that person is an instigator yeah. of millions potentially of murders. Yeah. Right? And God measures that. Mm. So some of the so-called holy men on this planet who are respected and revered from God's perspective are in fact in the worst possible condition. They're like Stalin. Mm. They are causing the genocide of other faiths. And therefore, they are like Stalin in God's, God's eyes and, and from the analysis of God's laws. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, and in fact, in many cases, they are more culpable than the very person who commits the deed of terrorism or the act of warfare. And why is that? Because the person who commits the deed of terrorism or act of warfare believes in what the person is saying, right? And they're using God as the leverage to believe. The mm -hmm. person who's the manipulator in this case is using God as the manipulation. So the, the person who's doing the manipulation is actually perpetrating false beliefs about God, yeah, which is one of the worst things you can do to any person on the planet and in the spirit world. And in so doing, they are perpetrating violence towards the fellow man, mm -hmm. even though they themselves are not carrying out the violence. So they're also cowards. Mm. They're not doing the very thing themselves that they're proclaiming others should do. Mm -hmm. So, so they're breaking so many laws and so many conditions for, of God's laws. And there are so many penalties that many times these particular people arrive in the spirit world in the worst possible conditions. Mm -hmm. Frequently, the religious leaders who perpetrate these kind of actions through their speech are the people who pass in the very worst of conditions. And just as bad conditioned as someone like Hitler, mm. in fact. Mm. So then what kind of penalties are, because remembering here we're talking about some of the penalties for disobedience mm -hmm. to God's laws, what kind of penalties would a person like that encounter? Well, there's immediate soul-based penalties. Obviously, the condition of their soul is such that they can't receive love. So they're not going to be in a place of reception of God's love or reception of human love, in fact. Mm -hmm. If a person perpetrates 
uh, unloving acts of uh, you know harmful acts towards another they're not capable of receiving love or giving it so mm -hmm. even though they say they love their child and they love their daughter and they love their son and they love their wife it's a bunch of crap to be frank mm -hmm. they don't feel it mm -hmm. they can't feel it it's all addiction they're not feeling it and their soul is being detuned from feeling it by the law by the law mm -hmm. By the law, because mm -hmm. the law penalizes the soul that acts in disharmony with love of fellow man. Mm. Right, that's what the law does. Now, in addition to all of that, so so the very th two biggest happinesses that they are possible to be able to achieve can't be achieved by that person until they address that particular problem. Yeah. So that's a huge penalty upon yeah. the soul. In addition to that, there's compensatory pain. So now, emotionally there is emotions of pain that now exist within that soul that will remain within their soul until that soul is repentant mm -hmm. and they may remain for hundreds if not thousands of years in the soul and when the soul opens to what it is done it will have to go through every one mm. every single one of those individual pains mm. right so that's pretty large penalties <laughs> <laughs> yes. associated. Not only that, God's laws determine the flow on effects of that particular perpetration of that particular action. Mm -hmm. So if you have got up and said, we should all go to war, but you personally did not go. Yep. Right. But you personally wanted to go and you personally said that everyone should go because it's God's way and whatever else these particular acts are going to have a terrible negative detriment on your soul because every person that dies now partly is attributable to your statements and mm. your instigations and every single one of those things will also be measured yeah so you can see very very large penalties associated with disobedience to god's laws yes and if people really understood the penalties associated with God, disobeying god's laws they would never disobey God's laws. <laughs> never. No. They would yeah. never choose to. Yeah. The problem is that because we don't and we're not we don't understand and we're not sensitive to the penalties, we think we can disobey with impunity. Mm. And that that feeling is corrected in our future life. It will be corrected. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So just from our notes, just a quick summary of mm -hmm. some of the penalties um, mm -hmm. f for a person who's disobedient to God's law. Yep. So pain and suffering, physical disease and illness. Maybe we should separate pain and suffering. Pain okay. being the instant response. Yep. Suffering being the long term effects. Mm -hmm. Yep. Similarly, disease and illness, would you separate them similarly? Uh, disease and illness. Illness generally is something that is, uh, you know, happens for a short period of time. Or sickness, so we could maybe call yeah. it, yeah. Uh, whereas disease is something that can eventually kill us, mm -hmm. a long-term effect. Mm -hmm. But yes, both are the physical results of us acting out of harmony with love in some respect yep. and, and choosing to disobey yep. some of God's laws. You also mentioned a sort of removal from love, like a self-removal from love. Yes. A lessening of happiness. Yes. Um, there's also uh, other effects, including damage to our environment. Yes. So that's uh, living and non-living creatures of God are affected by yes, our... Yes, inanimate and animate creatures are all affected by our choices to, to, da to, to disobey God's laws. Mm -hmm. Damage to other people is part of the penalties. Yes. And damage to our our personal relationship with God as well. Yeah, so huge damage. Yes. Like, there's so much damage, in fact, that the majority of people who live on the planet, unfortunately, pass into the hells of the spirit world and spend many of their first 30, 40, 50, 100 years in that place trying to undo some mm. of the damage that they've done as, and become repentant for and ask for forgiveness for the damage that they've done to others. When it comes to uh, forgiveness now, which we'll talk about uh, our very next in the next question, yeah. there's obviously other effects as well. Mm. So let's talk now specifically about the penalties for refusing to forgive. Yeah, an interesting concept, isn't it? It is, because a lot of us think that... Uh, Forgiveness is an option. It's an option <laughs> and it's not something that I should be penalised for not forgiving. Mm. 
it's quite it's quite if you engage with that idea emotionally it's quite confronting yeah it's a very challenging idea yes emotionally if you if you because we're basically saying some of god's laws penalize you for not forgiving (laughs) even though you have been been harmed harmed. and now there's laws operating on me that are penalizing me for not for not giving up the hurt but but if we remember the difference that we drew earlier in the the conversation mm-hmm. about a law acting uh, to cause us unhappiness from a creator who's resentful, yes, yes then it feels pretty yucky to mm-hmm. think that I'm being penalised for not forgiving. But if we remember that we have a creator who creates law in order to bring about our happiness, mm-hmm. Ah, now so and, and the us? corrective mechanism within the law. Exactly. So that's telling me, ah, oh, so if there, if I have a penalty for refusing to forgive another, that must mean that there's one of God's laws that are acting to encourage me to forgive, correcting a lack of forgiveness inside of me because it's going to bring me towards happiness. Yes. Mm. Every time we refuse to forgive, we cause our own unhappiness. Mm. It's, this is a very, very important thing to yeah. understand. It is. Because most, what I see most people doing is they believe they're forgiving for the other person, but actually forgiveness does a lot of things to your soul, right? And, and it will cause your happiness if you forgive. Mm. And if you choose to not forgive, you will have very, very long terms of unhappiness mm. in your soul. So this is very important to understand this principle. It is. And at this point in the discussion, we're really just wanting to establish, are there penalties for refusing to forgive others? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And, and fortunately <laughs> so. Because emotions, if you think about it, Forgive, not forgiving someone creates emotions yeah. inside of the soul, resentment, hatred, anger. Mm. And, the, and these kind of emotions are very painful to your soul and they also create disease and suffering inside of your body. And they create intentions, don't they? That Which can, can be unloving in their own right. Towards others. Towards others, yes. Yeah. And therefore cause a lot of your sin towards others. Mm. So you can see straight away that not forgiving has many negative side effects. Mm-hmm. And the negative side effects are there to remind you that you're not forgiving yeah. and that you need to forgive and that forgiving will benefit you and it will bring you happiness. Yeah. And, and this is where I notice a lot of people just, uh, when it comes to that concept, they in total rebelling to mm. that concept. And lots of reasons why, which we'll probably discuss further on in our discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but at this stage, we want to understand that refusing to forgive is breaking some of God's highest laws. And therefore, refusing to forgive causes some of the highest penalties mm. and the highest amount of pain that you could experience as a person mm. emotionally mm-hmm. is caused by not forgiving somebody, yeah. holding on to it, holding on to the pain and suffering that they caused. Yes. Right? actually then causes huge amounts of damage inside of you. Yeah. And not forgiving them means that this pain is never released mm-hmm. and then your, and your entire life now will be defined by the pain that you have not released. Yeah. 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 Mm. All right. So we're wrapping up this sort of section that we've been talking about that really bringing the relevance of god's laws Mm. so we've we've laid a lot of groundwork haven't we about why god created laws why are laws relevant to the discussion of forgiveness how laws operate upon the soul and the different penalties that can occur when we try to act in disobedience or when we yeah when we intend to act in disobedience with god's laws yeah um and and the the, you say the consequences of breaking or upholding the law, disobeying or obeying the law. We can see there are specific consequences and even just having an intention to obey (laughs) and an intention to disobey has its own consequences. And and in the end, we should be at this stage understanding that God's laws are very refined. They, they, you know, they grind down to the size of a sand 
piece of sand. You know, that, that's how they're so refined in the way that they measure everything, quantify everything and act upon everything and that they will never, they can never be broken. Mm -hmm. They are always going to be upheld. Disobedience is going to have its consequence. Obedience is going to have its consequence. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And all of this is very relevant continuing on in our discussion, which mm -hmm. we'll do after a short break. Yeah, that's yeah. no, true. Mm -hmm.